I'm Vicki Hogarth and welcome to Southwest Magazine. I'm joined today by the MP of New Brunswick Southwest, John Williamson. Thank you, John, so much for being here today. It is my pleasure. I think the last time you and I saw one another was when you and Patrick were up in Ottawa for your hearings before the, uh, the, the CRTC and your television news license application and, and how that's going and I hope it's going well. But I'll say this as well, I'm always pleased to host any constituents that come to, to our parliament to show them around, because it is really an incredible building. It's where the decisions, of course, that we, uh, we live by are, are made, many of them. But it's also a special place just because it's the, the cornerstone of our democracy. It was a thrill to, to meet you in parliament to go for yeah. lunch and go to question period. Uh, really an exciting experience for us to have the opportunity to see you in action in Ottawa. I know you come here regularly, yeah. but to see you on Parliament Hill is also very exciting. So no, well, well, that's it. And uh, I mean, you were there on a, on a great day as well. Wednesday is the question, the Prime Minister's question period, and uh, the leader of the official opposition, Pierre Polliver, is uh, fields all the all the questions. The Prime Minister answers all of them, and it's uh, it's it's a unique day because you see the. The, the two key leaders in in the country really jostling and getting a sense of their uh, their vision and and their ideas. So it's a I mean any day in, any day in Parliament is a good day, but it's really when when the two leaders kind of go head to head, it's 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 quite interesting. Well, I think I think we'll be back before the CRTC in April again, All so right I might then. see so, you again yes. there this spring. Very good. Uh, I want to talk to start about um, issues that are international issues, but also happening right sure. here at home. Uh, we're talking about homelessness a lot yeah. now in rural New Brunswick, which wasn't a topic we talked about that often even a couple years ago, particularly looking at St. Stephen. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about what you're hearing about in your office? Well, that, so this week, um, uh, so, so Parliament's off until uh, January the, the 29th, although I'll be uh, back uh, a bit early for committee hearings uh, next week on public accounts, which, uh, which I chair. But this week, um, and, and since Christmas, I've been trucking around the riding, uh, meeting people, and, and, and sitting down with constituents in, in my office. And I'm finding more people are coming in to talk about just the cost of living, making ends meet, uh, and you know, folks who, um, you know, you, you wouldn't expect in, in some cases. Um, but between you know, for, for seniors who are maybe living alone in their home between the property tax bill, the heating bill, uh, the food bill, and, and then prescription medicine, um, families are beyond the, the breaking point. For younger, younger families, working families, um, the cost of rent, uh, buying a home, financing uh, a home, uh, and then of course um, the vulnerable category of the homeless community as well, which is, which is growing. And you know, I fear it's uh, it's things are, are 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 not going to improve quickly uh, because it takes time to build homes uh, and 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 create you know the the environment where people start building again in the construction. It, it and, and of course homes don't go up overnight as well. So this is all you know. It's a very very difficult time. I'm hearing it directly. People coming in looking for for relief uh, and and not finding uh, enough of it. Mm -hmm. And you know, this is where I think in the, the next election, uh, the federal election, which you know, we're still 20 months away from it uh, at, the, at the furthest, it could happen any time, but it I think is going to be a great debate over uh, affordability issues, homelessness, uh, building homes, helping you know, young families afford the new home, uh, helping seniors as well. You know, we lay the blame at the feet of the, of the prime minister. Canada wasn't like this before Justin Trudeau, and we don't believe the country will be like this after Justin Trudeau. On one measure after another, I mean, take the carbon tax. It's going to go up again in July. This will put pressure on gas bills, home heating, and food. Uh, as long as we keep increasing the cost of energy on farmers to produce food, on the truckers that ship food, and even on the storage of food in food stores, you know, the, the refrigeration, the costs are going to keep going up and we want to repeal that. The same thing is with, with housing though uh, as well. The, the federal government's kind of spending binge while uh, has, has driven up uh, inflation and the Bank of Canada's commitment to keep interest rates benefited borrowers across this country who have bought up housing stock 
everywhere, pushing out young Canadians. To the price now where if you live in parts of this country, uh, the big cities, it can take 20 years now just to save enough for a, for, a, for a down payment. Previously, it would take 25 years to pay off a mortgage. So the system is, is broken and there's a lot of hardship out there. And so this is going to be, I think, a very uh, uh, important election, an election where we're going to have, I think, two sharp visions. And, you know, this, this is, look, this is a prime minister who in a past election said he did not give much thought to monetary policy. Monetary policy is what sets the interest rates. And today we have sky high interest rates and young homeowners cannot get into the market. So it's, it's, it's bad. People are, as you know, uh, in, in, our, in our neighborhoods, we're seeing homelessness and the, and the, and the struggle there. Uh, and it is a very difficult solution. And now I see the prime minister and his housing minister saying homelessness is a provincial and municipal problem. Well, when Trudeau was first running in 2015, he was vowing to tackle homelessness. But it's hard work, and now they're just trying to wash their hands of it. We're going to hold them accountable to do more to ensure that homeless people have options that are that beyond just living on the streets or living in a tent. And you, you mentioned something that it's something I'm looking into right now, particularly in St. Stephen, is um, the idea of people buying up a lot of housing. And I'm early in some research about um, yeah. a company that's out of province buying up a lot of buildings in St. Stephen that are now, for the most part, off the market right. for renters. And that contributes to our housing crisis. Um, it does. There's so many factors at play. Um, but what we what can we do in, in cases like that when we look at how popular the Maritimes became in the pandemic? Uh, I don't know if that's what's happening. Are people buying yeah. up properties and expecting the value to go up and then ultimately affecting well, the local housing? I, mean, I, I think a couple things. Look, there, there's no doubt that during the, the pandemic, uh, uh, the Maritimes became a nice place for people to, to move to. Uh, I've noticed people who have moved here from uh, other provinces, notably uh, Ontario. Now, most of these people have moved here, bought a home, moved in. But what you're pointing to is one of the top criticisms that, that, that my leader, Pierre Pollard, has made in Parliament. The Bank of Canada kept interest rates artificially low. The Prime Minister said, there's nothing to worry about, keep borrowing money. But for people, so people were able to go and buy with, with money, were able to go take out low interest uh, mortgages or, or financing and buy these properties. And this has happened right across mm -hmm. the country. And this has removed housing stock that would have been there previously as rental units. And, and it is one thing uh, in St. Stephen that has contributed to some people losing a, losing, a, losing a dwelling. But across the country, it's also contributed to these homes being purchases purchased by, by larger businesses that have taken them off the market for younger Canadians. So, mm -hmm. so prices have gone up, now interest rates uh, are, are, are through the roof, and, uh, and it's a real problem. And you know, I, I, I suspect these are, uh, yeah, these, these, are, these are investors, I don't know exactly what, what, who, who you're talking about, but, but you know, we're, we're seeing more investment dollars going into housing and housing coming off uh, uh, the market or being used as rental as opposed to being available for young families to, to buy. The system is is broken, mm -hmm. and we need to, uh, to to fix it. And you know the the government, I think, is 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 struggling to do that. But they've had eight years, and for them now to say that our ideas don't work or they're going to fix it, I think uh, stretches belief. So we'll be holding them accountable to ensure that when they say they when they announce their fifth housing plan that hasn't delivered, we're going to hold them accountable uh, for that and for the number of homes that are actually being built. In, in the last year, we, we built fewer homes in 2022 than we did in 1955. I mean, this, this is a government that, has, that, that, was, that ignored this problem, and now it's, it's here with a vengeance. And you know, I can understand, I mean, I, I see it, and I know the, the, the difficulties that people in our communities uh, are, are facing who are on limited budgets, and I can also understand from the perspective of young people who are trying mm -hmm. to get in, in, into a home and just can't do it. It's yes. frustrating. This, uh, the specific example, just so people at home know uh, that I am looking into mm -hmm. it, that I've had uh, many letters about it, Starshine Properties from Alberta. Um, and from what I can tell, it's about 20 properties in right. St. Stephen, but it's impossible for me so far to track down um, the person in charge of Starshine yeah. Properties. Yeah. <laughs> and to just know, well, why are you? I would love an answer to, yeah. why are you buying these buildings in St. And, Stephen? And, you know, it's what, what I think is is most difficult um, is that 
they're not being used for housing anymore. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, so again, more and more, the, the, the challenges, the problems that we've seen mostly in Western Canada were buildings being purchased largely for investment opportunities and then sitting vacant, it's now shifting to Eastern Canada. They've started to take measures in Western Canada to impose higher taxes. I don't, I'm not sure how well those are working, mm -hmm. but those might be solutions we need to, we need to look at to get people housed again. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to pivot to talk about the 988 hotline, yes. which is for suicide and mental health. Can you talk a little bit about the, the implementation of that? I can. So the 988 uh, is, a, is a line that, uh, a phone line that just, just went into service a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it's mental health support, suicide uh, prevention line that is national in scope. Uh, it was put forward initially as an idea as a conservative private member's bill. Uh, went through Parliament, uh, picked up support. So by the end, it was it was it had a lot of support across across the aisle. Uh, it passed in in law about a year ago. So there was some uh, there was some delay in setting it up, which which we were quite loud about in Parliament to get going on it. And we're certainly pleased that it's now in action because it it gives people that are maybe looking for to just just to just to reach out and find some help uh, an easy to access option nine eight eight. Uh, and uh, and it's it's there across the country. So you know it's, it's one more measure. Now obviously more has to be done, more more support for people with uh, mental challenges, mental mental health challenges, um, uh, have to be put in place. I think you know the 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 COVID era I think put a you know made a a bad problem even worse. So I think I think communities across the uh, the the country Canadians uh, are struggling with this, and you know sometimes family members just look for for solutions and a little bit of help as well and this is just one more uh one more step i think but i think it's one that that saw parliament working together uh the idea came from an opposition member government members eventually supported it the government picked it up and now it's in place so it's a it's it's it shows that parliament does work together and and and, and can get things done by working together uh one topic you and i've talked about quite a bit uh on this very show uh, is made medical assistance yes. in dying um and the controversial uh, expansion of yeah. that to include mental, mental illness health, yeah. can you talk about um upcoming committee yeah. hearings and where we're at so things haven't changed a lot since i was uh since i was last speaking to you about this parliament is going to uh begin to look at this there's a there's a parliamentary committee that is going to be struck to uh determine how this should be handled to 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 review it the government unfortunately the liberal government is still sending signals that they're planning to proceed uh, with this uh, so we're hoping that with some good testimony some good committee work uh, we might be able to change that because as you know as, as we're hearing from experts you know mental health you have highs and lows and the medical assisted uh, uh, death or, or euthanasia was, was supposed to be about people who are near death and suffering. Um, there's certainly people suffer with, with, from, from men mental health, but it is not something that directly kills them. Mm -hmm. And so we have great concerns at opening up the door to people with, who are mental health challenges opting for assisted death. Uh, is really short-sighted and not at all about compassion. Mm. We think people, you know, I think people that that are that are, that are that are suffering mental health should be work trying to work through it. And again, I know there's ups and downs. It's there's there, there's no easy days, but some days are better than other. And if you speak, and in, in, in there are people who have who have not only survived it but recovered as well. So there, there, are, there you know, there's often light at the end of the tunnel, mm -hmm. although sometimes that light is a far way off. So this this I think kind of you know speaks to who we are as a, as a nation and uh, and I, I hope uh, I hope parliamentarians come together I, I expect there are probably a good number of good-natured liberal members in, in their caucus who are queasy about this as well um, so you know I'm, I'm hoping parliamentarians will will come together to get us on a I think a, a wiser path than, than opening up uh, the, the opening the doors have made to uh, to mental health yes is there a discussion about the, the fear that maybe that would contribute to the stigma. If you saw that whatever mm. illness you suffered from is meets yeah. the criteria for MAID, I think that that could have detrimental effects on how you go forward in life. If, 
I think you're right. Uh, I think I think you're right. I mean, we're, we're already seeing some of the, the 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 dark side of even the program that's in place, where veterans, for example, who are suffering um, um, from non-life-threatening um, issues, uh, could be homelessness, could be could be mental health, are, are being offered made or being made being suggested to them as as an alternative. Um, this is not right. We need to ensure that any policy is what mapped out well and really confined and it doesn't grow or enlarge so it's viewed as a, a solution to bureaucratic difficulties we need to find there you know we need to fix the bureaucratic hurdles that are preventing people from getting the help of the services they need not just try to direct people uh, to to uh, to to kill themselves with a with the, with the assistance of a doctor so it's a you know, it's a it, it's a topic that is difficult because mm -hmm. uh, there are many views uh, on this. But I think we have to recognize, you know, our compassion of a nation is to help people, not to uh, not to urge them to opt into uh, to uh, to uh, to uh, to made. There's a, there's a really good episode of Fifth Estate that that looks into yeah. this very topic. That's worth checking out for people at home. Also on the agenda in Ottawa is the um, Arrive Can and looking back, I told you right before yes. we started filming, I was making room on my phone last night. I'm like, I think I can finally delete this. So uh, yes. freed up a little space on my phone. Um, can you tell me uh, what that review is exactly? Yes, so um, you'll, you'll be right on the news. So um, the Canada's Auditor General, um, Karen Hogan, just sent uh, a note to the Speaker of the House of Commons saying that her and her team will be tabling their audit of the Arrive Can app, um, which I'll remind viewers cost $54 million. And nobody can explain how the cost went so high, because of course you'll remember that a few weeks after it was launched uh, and the price was, was reported, a number of IT developers uh, came up with something very similar in a weekend for, I mean, a fraction of a cost wouldn't uh, wouldn't capture it. I mean, it was minuscule, a couple hundred thousand dollars compared to what the, the federal government spent. So, the auditor is going to have this big uh, report coming out. Uh, so, I, I think I think your, your audience will remember that I'm chairman of the public counts committee. It's coming before our committee, so we'll be having uh, uh, hearings on this beginning on February uh, the 12th with the auditor to find out what has she discovered about the costs. Um, we think it was, you know, the and the and, and the, the excessive cost as well, and how consultants work with the government. Uh, we think there was a lot of, um, you know, fleecing of taxpayers in this, and and we're hoping the auditor is going to provide some answers here, and then we'll see where where, where it goes. So that that will be kind of front and center because um, this what again this the auditor did this review at the request of Parliament. Usually the auditor every year her and her team kind of go through government and they decide what they're going to do, look at this year and next year. Uh, but occasionally Parliament will ask the auditor to review uh, an issue and this is one that Parliament asked her to look at because, because of the cost and because of the difficulties getting answers from the, from the government. So, uh, I think that in some ways I have amnesia when it comes to COVID. It's not really that long ago mm -hmm. and yet uh, when we talk about it, it feels like yes. ancient history. But you're also um, reviewing, can you tell us a little bit about where we're at with the Winnipeg Lab? Right. So uh, again, just just to remind the audience. So um, uh, in 2023, I was named uh, as one of four members of Parliament looking at the Winnipeg Lab documents related to the firing of two scientists way back in uh, 2019. Um, with links to though the whole file is with links to uh, interference from mainland China. Um, the federal government. Uh, uh, did not want to release this information. Parliament kept pushing for it. Uh, so finally the government agreed, okay, four MPs will sit down, they'll review all the documents, they will indicate what parts they would like to, to, to be released to the public. A panel of judges will then review it. So we're at that kind of in-between stage. We've gone through the, the, the documents. Uh, the judges now are going through our recommendations. They are the final decision makers. So they're kind of working with, with the various teams. Uh, and so I'm hoping this uh, this uh, report will be released sometime in I'll say I'm hoping before the the summer recess mm. in in June. Um, I'd like to say it was earlier, but I also know how Ottawa can work at some points, and we'll see if we get if we got hung up in anything. But this is an important review because the Winnipeg Lab is it should be 
one of Canada's most secure locations. It holds some of the world's deadliest viruses, Ebola, for, for example, which if, if, if you catch it, you're going to die, chances are. Uh, or nine times out of 10 or 99 times out of 100, you're going to die. So these, these, these diseases are held in this lab. They are meant to be high security, not only to contain them, but also to keep people out. Only people with, with high access are permitted into it. But something went wrong where uh, there were people that were not authorized to be in there. There were shipments of Ebola. This is public now. I'm not revealing anything that, 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 I, that I shouldn't reveal. But there was a shipment of, of, of Ebola. It looked like it was clandestine to, to mainland China. Uh, so it's, it's quite a big story. And I think when it comes out, there'll be, there'll be, uh, there'll be a, a lot of uh, reviews in Parliament on it. Um, this is assuming, of course, the judges tend to agree with more with us than with the government and we do release the information. But it's, it's something that we've been looking at. It has been fascinating, and I'm hoping, and my, my, my position on this has been, we need to reveal as much as we possibly can to Canadians, so Canadians have a sense of how this lab is operating. Uh, any, any malfeasance from the, the, the government uh, of, of China is, is exposed, as well as shortcomings in our own security establishment. Mm, wow, yeah, it's, it's amazing. Um, I think even as a journalist, because of the collective trauma of COVID. Uh, there's so many ways I can just pretend it didn't happen. Yeah. And then you get these reminders even on Facebook of yeah. a memory three yeah. years ago and you're in a mask. Yeah. And uh, I think we are at that time where we're looking for more answers now. Well, that's um, right. And there is a very interesting link in this story in that the Ebola transfer that was transferred to uh, China was transferred to the Wuhan Institute of Virology, the, the, the lab that was at the center of the uh, the outbreak. Now, that's not to say. I mean, the question of where the 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 uh, uh, the, pa the the pandemic originated, whether it was the wet market or a lab, uh, is 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 still debated. We might never know. Um, uh, but the lab they talk about is the same lab that the Winnipeg our, our Winnipeg lab w was was dealing with. So, uh, this this strikes close to a lot of recent history as well. Um, I love when you're here because we can talk about issues that we've been talking about every yes. time you're here as well as ones that are uh, more to the season we're in which is winter yes. and we've seen a lot of winter storms lately and of course you're MP of a coastal region. Yes. Um, what are you hearing from people in the area about how they've been affected by winter storms? Well, I know St. Andrews in particular, Grim and Ann, yeah. uh, the last couple of had That's right, and, and, and St. Stephen as well. With yeah. I mean, I mean St. Stephen, uh, you know, at, at, at high tide, we might not think of it as a coastal community, but, but certainly at, at, at high tide, uh, when the winds are blowing the wrong way, there can be there can be challenges. Well, you know, uh, on on one hand, um, let's let's be smart about this. I mean, this is an area that that has experienced big storms in the past. I mean, you know, I'm just old enough to remember um, uh, the twin storms in '76 and '77 that took down breakwaters all across the uh, the front. Street, including the one that was then at my my, my grandparents' house, um, and then in the 1980s, uh, another one which uh, which which took down the breakwater at my house and other other homes, um, and and so we do see these storms, and it's it's usually because I mean we are fortunate here with the tides. Usually, I mean for 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 damage to happen, you have to have kind of a couple things happen at once. You know, the winds coming a certain way, uh, a big storm, and of course a high tide tides out it's not a problem generally because it's it's out there and so the the, the storms though recently uh, have all had that kind of you know three three components uh, all at once and so uh, they are increasing in in intensity uh, and and homes that are in vulnerable areas um, in some cases are at are at risk but are as are low-lying areas like the market square in St Andrews um, uh, around the the intersection in in St. Stephen, and then of course some of the areas on Grand Manan and other islands in in particular, and so that's why you've seen in the last 10, 15 years federal wharves being built that are bigger and stronger than they than they ever ever were, with with more stone barriers and and higher wharves and 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 built with stronger materials, and I think you know communities are going to are 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 in the process. I know for I don't want to take away from any of the work that's been done here in St. Andrews, for example, have looked at mitigation and 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 construction to kind of stall that off. But as as the mayor of St. Andrews himself said, uh, 
you know, we're never going to be in a position to, to protect every corner of, of, the, of the coastal community. So it is also up, on, up, up to homeowners to, to build in areas that are, are, are safe as well and that, uh, and that if, they, if they choose to live on the edge of the, the bay, there's a certain risk that, come, that comes with that. And look, I, I don't say that flippantly because you know, I have a home um, that's on the water as well. And in the storms that were in December, uh, those are the ones that really kind of impacted my property. Uh, you know, the, the water was, was up and, uh, you know, the seaweed was, was, was left behind and it was, uh, it was, it was a storm you don't, you don't see often. Um, so it is, you know, when it, when it happens, it is, it is concerning. So, you know, I think, I think, I think all levels of government are going to have to plan for this, spend money on infrastructure and mitigation, uh, to ensure that when storms come through, we're as protected as much as we possibly can be. We have about a minute left, right. if you can believe it. Uh, so I wonder what are you most excited about tackling going ahead into 2024 as we kick off the new year? Yeah, uh, well, I mean, it's, it's a new year. So with that comes comes new opportunity. Um, when Parliament goes back, I mean, I'm going to have my hands full, really full in the in the short order with the auditor's report and and hopefully concluding our work on the on the Winnipeg lab. But we're also going to be going into Parliament, holding the government account. And you know, if a government member was sitting here, he or she would be saying, you know, we're going to put forward solutions. They have the power of the checkbook, the power to pre present budget. We're going to have to put forward both a critique of the government, but also our solutions to build uh, a better, a better Canada. Um, but you know, we we think this is a government that is great at photo ops and announcements and not good at follow throughs. We want to make sure the follow throughs happen. That when money for housing, for example, is promised, it actually leads to houses being built, not more bureaucracy. So it's, it's a twin combination of projects to get done, uh, hold the government accountable. And of course, uh, you know, as we move into the spring, the days get longer here. And, uh, and it means that I like to get out on the road more because there's not, you know, in, in spring when I'm trucking around New Brunswick Southwest, I can get home at 10 p.m. and it's, uh, it's still light. Uh, this time of year, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a little different. So I'm heading out early this morning uh, to, uh, to get to a few places, and we'll be doing that for the next week before, uh, before going back to Parliament. Well, I appreciate how often you make us a yes. stop on your list. I know that the, the viewers love it as well. It keeps us connected to, to everything hear. in Ottawa. So thank you so much for thank you. coming in once again. We'll do it again. My guest today has been the MP of New Brunswick Southwest, John Williamson. I'm Vicki Hogarth. Thank you for watching Southwest Magazine. Southwest Magazine is a news and public affairs production of CHCO Television.